prime directives. Serve the public trust. Protect the innocent. Thank you! Uphold the law. It's dead girls! It was considered to be just another low-budget science fiction movie with a silly title. Perhaps you're aware of the RoboCop program developed by myself at Security Concepts. RoboCop is a little bit like the guy who rides into a corrupt town and cleans it up. Your move, creep. And to me, this was very clearly a metaphor of the night in Shining Armor. Let the woman go. You are under arrest. It's just such incredibly good filmmaking. It's as tight as a nest of Chinese boxes. I mean, you can just keep opening these lids and finding different things inside, but each one of those boxes is perfectly handcrafted. That film is very, very well put together. Although the movie is set in the future, like any movie, it's a product of its time. And this is really a product of the Reagan era. I say good business is where you find it. I like violence, you know? I like violence in movies. I wanted to show Satan killing Jesus. Cinematic robots have a long and illustrious history. Some of the earliest films, in fact, either had mechanical people or artificial humans. There is positively no human agency employed whatsoever in controlling it. Something what people are dreaming of, nah? being a, a, a person, a ma mankind being a machine. Nah? Musicians of the world unite. Automation is on the way. I think there are two films that were important to me when I shot um, Robocop, which was The Day the Earth Stood Still, and the other one was Fritz Lang's movie Metropolis. And you can see a lot of parallels, especially with the robot that uh, Lang invented. Even as early as 1922, Lang sort of foretold and forecast the Western culture's ambivalence about technology. Maria is this beautiful, shining, durable construct that at the same time is manipulative and violent and uh, uh, sexual and all the darker elements of what started to creep into technology and man's awareness of technology. Ours is a male version of, uh, of Fritz Lang. We have a little bit more a sophisticated outlook, a bit more high tech, but it's still very close. Robocop, who is he? What is he? Where does he come from? RoboCop was an idea that I came up with when I was an executive at um, Universal Pictures and I couldn't stand my, my job, so I went off and wrote a screenplay. Michael Miner came through the door and said, oh, you want to write a script about a robot? I like robots. And there we were. The first idea for RoboCop was a robot. And then it very quickly wasn't, it became a man who became a robot. Ed and I were thinking of two ideas independently. He had an idea called RoboCop, which was about a robot police officer. What is this shit? And I was playing with an idea called Super Cop about a character who has an accident and then is hooked up to an appliance that enhances his powers. We were writing Robocop when Terminator was being finished and we waited until the script was finished before we saw the film. I guess they could both be called postmodern robot films in the sense that the humor is very dark. I think that the Cameron film is much more a horror film than Robocop, which to me is social satire with some very real emotions in it. They brought it to Jonathan Kaplan, and Jonathan Kaplan didn't want to do it, so he suggested that they bring it to me. Orion had produced The Terminator, and I'm sure the success of that film led them to take a chance. We went over to Orion, and, and they just said, OK, let's go. And it was like, whoa, we sold the script. We're writing it. We basically went right through the list of every halfway decent American director, and every one of them turned it down. And I have a feeling most of them probably never got past the title page that said RoboCop. They could just envision it on their resume, you know, <laughs> thinking, no, no, I don't want to go there. Everybody had reservations about the title because the title is just basically silly. And no matter who you told the title to, you could just see it, the expression on their face like, God, why are they involved with such a piece of junk? You know, so we often thought about trying to come up with a better title, but it, it stuck. 
In fact, I remember Orion saying, we can never sell it with that title. It's stupid. It sounds like a kid's movie. But in the end, a title that tells you what the movie is is, is really quite good. Action! Ba -ba 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 -ba! Go! I'd always been this huge fan of Paul Verhoeven. Barbara Boyle had just finished doing Flesh and Blood with him for Orion. She said, well, let me send it to Paul Verhoeven. Paul was having trouble in Holland. He just was not getting along with the uh, people in the film business there, I guess. First movies that I did, included Soldier of Orange, were always financed by government of the right wing. Now, when the government changed to the left wing, I, I started to have problems. It started already with, with Spetters, because they thought it was decadent and perverted. Paul's a director. He can direct actors. He, beautiful camera work. I mean, Kichi Tipple, Soldier of Mars, Spetters, Turkish Delight. I mean, these are good pictures. <laughs> I can't imagine in a million years that Paul Verhoeven would want to do this picture. And sure enough, he said no. When I got finally that script of Robocop uh, and I read it, I thought it was extremely silly and stupid. I threw it on the floor and saying, I'm not going to shoot this kind of rubbish. My wife picked up that script, Robocop, and read it. And she said, you know, yeah, this is perhaps not, uh, it's not Shakespeare, but it is a script with more layers than you think. Martine read it and said, there's decapitations and people getting their arms uh, ripped off. You'll like it. And indeed, he said, well, I have never seen uh, the hero get his hand blown off. And he, he sent us a telegram saying that he would, uh, he would do the picture. And no one was more shocked than I. In the movies like Turkey's Delight or Soldier of Orange, The Force Man and Spetters, which are the v most well-known in the United States, you are really talking about people and no, not special effects. So it's strange because I had never done anything like that. And it was not that I, were, uh, that I was craving to do it. It was not that I thought, my God, I, I, I remember these movies out of my use and I want to do them myself. I think that in general I would say that I, I was not a big fan of, 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 of science fiction. It doesn't matter, we're going to blank his memory anyway. I think it's really amazing if you look at Paul's work. There's nothing that indicates anything like this before and he effortlessly pulls that off. Well, he signed the release forms and he joined the force. He's legally dead. We can do pretty much what we want to. This cynical, very unblinking look at violence was something that Paul could do. Ooh, guns, guns, guns! A good director can adopt to any kind of genre, to any genre. That's the key. If, I mean, if the guy's got talent, he can do anything, you know? And Paul can do anything. I often say that he is a visceralist, not a visualist. Kubrick's a visualist. He, like, is very cold and concise, and he wants you to see it and study it. And Paul wants you to be reacting like, shit, the next one might hit me. Shit! As I started to work with the writers, I picked up so many layers and, and additional elements, and I got really inspired by what was already on the paper, by extending that, emphasizing it, pushing it. And so that, um, ultimately, I, I, it might be my best uh, American movie foreign directors critique America better than Americans can because they're on the outside and they approach it anthropologically. And that's another thing that I think Paul brought to the material. I really have a lot of respect for Paul. He's the real deal. He's like a real director. You know, he's totally focused. It was really me thinking, okay, uh, science fiction is not my genre, but I, I think I understand something of the soul of Robocop. And there is something artistic about the whole project. And, and something humanitarian, if you want to. Murphy transferring in from Metro South. We had been looking for an actor that could do a Robocop for a very long time. I mean, and we didn't make any progress. For, for a moment, we thought that we would take Michael Ironside. We saw Michael Ironside and liked him a lot, but he was a little too big, we thought, to fit the costume. It was a given from the beginning that they would have to find a certain body type because they were literally going to construct the robo suit around the actor. So you didn't want someone who was too large because you would have all kinds of problems about you know fitting the person into it and also being able to move. After three, four months of sh searching, we still hadn't found anybody. And then ultimately, uh, somebody called us and said, well, Peter Weller is in New York, and why don't you visit him? He might be interested. Peter Weller made a bit of a splash on a film called Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. And John Davison certainly was aware of Peter's work in Buckaroo Banzai, so he was one of the people who tested for it. I pointed out that it would be a life of suffering and that he would not be happy. Peter had martial arts training, so that was appealing. We knew that a lot of his performance would be mime, so we needed somebody who liked the idea of 
doing mime. He started immediately to take lessons about choreographing his steps, basically how, how he would have to walk with his Robocop costume on. Peter very much had in mind these kind of quick bird-like movements, particularly when he is fighting. Originally, we had cast Stephanie Zimbalist in the role of Lewis. And a couple of weeks before we started shooting, she pulled out. So we were in a mad scramble to find someone to replace her. And fortunately, we found Nancy Allen, who was available. I haven't really had a chance to introduce myself. I'm Ann Lewis. Nancy Allen, primarily before that, had been playing kind of shallow, bitchy teenage characters. Of Carrie, of course, is her signature part. But she was also always known for having these long strawberry curls. The very first thing Paul said to her is, cut your hair. I'm a mess. Paul was actually trying, to, once again, to take a performer with an established persona and tweak it. You really don't remember me, do you? Dick Jones, the character who Ronnie Cox plays, is one of the most evil, manipulative, and corrupt of the OCP officials. You just fucked with the wrong guy. But prior to playing Dick Jones, Ronnie Cox, for the most part, had played the exact opposite type of character. Wholesome family man or country guitar strumming, you know, ordinary guys. You know, just very, very nice characters. I'm confident that we can go to prototype within 90 days. Rob Bottin, who created the suit, works by sculpting everything in clay three-dimensionally. He started doing a number of full-size sculptures of Robocop, very little 2D art. We would go over, we being Ed Neumeyer, the writer, and Paul Verhoeven and myself would go over to Rob's shop and watch this thing progress. I mean, for a while, he looked like Judge Dredd. For a while, he looked like, oh, a real superhero with a huge uh, chest and shoulders. But we always went back to sleek, you know, like a product of Detroit in a way. If Braun, had, the German company, had made a knight in shining armor, that's what he would look like. Ed had found these Japanese comic books where they make these kind of bulky robots with big shoulders, but then in steel. Rob's costume, in the beginning, was much more like a, kind of a bit modernistic version of, the, of, of Fritz Lang. But we thought, oh, we are going to do something better. We go to this Japanese comic books will help us to make it really revolutionary instead of being influenced by the past, you know. And we fucked it up completely. That was a big explosion, artistic explosion between our group nearly and Rob Boutin, who ultimately said, you know, I cannot work this way. Then we, I think we stepped backwards finally, but when we had lost already months by fooling around, by the time we stepped backwards, he had lost. 40, 50 percent of what was good, you know, so it was terrible. Robertine was extremely frustrated and, I mean, he couldn't even talk to us anymore, certainly not to me, who he saw as the, moan, as, the, as the main uh, guilty person. Rob figured out that the way to do this uh, would be to create an undersuit that would be flexible and then to create a harness that fit over the undersuit where you could hang solid pieces of the fiberglass exoskeleton. Sometimes we were e really rubbing it with, with, uh, with oil or wax or something that it really got shiny. And I always put a lot of different lights from different directions so that the appearance of the, of the Robocop was like a figure of reflections. You could always see it outlined in light. It has a power. I always got the camera very low, on very low angles, and the lower the camera is, the more the camera looks up to him, the bigger Robocop appears. Well, we shot the movie in Dallas. We did go scout Detroit with Paul, although it did fairly well in the sort of seedy urban department. It didn't have any kind of futuristic skyline or any kind of modern look to it at all. Robocop was uh, shot in Dallas from August through October of 1986, which is like the most humid and the hottest, steamiest, nastiest time to be in that part of the world. The temperature on the days that they were shooting there was about 120 to 130 degrees inside. Peter was literally losing pounds of weight every day out of water dehydration. He was constantly having to be hydrated. Peter had a uh, mime coach uh, by the name of Moni Yakim. And he wanted to work with uh, Moni on practicing basic robotic moves and, and to, to create a character through movement. 
Peter and Moni rehearsed for many, many weeks before the start of filming. Rob Bottin was supposed to deliver the suit about two or three weeks before uh, principal photography, but as these things go, the suit arrived on the day we needed it to be shot. Rob was, was very much delayed because of our problems, isn't it, that we had created partially ourselves, and uh, that's why the costume came so late to the set. And it took Peter 11 hours to get into the suit the first time because everything needed to be fitted and adjusted and changed and shaved. So by the time Peter <laughs> walked out of the trailer door 11 hours later, he was in a complete state because everything he had rehearsed with Moni didn't work in this suit. We had a terrible time and we had to stop production because we got into, uh, into a conflict, but the conflict was basically because he said, I can't do it, and, it, and I don't know how to walk, and basically and we said, uh, and, and the production said, well, I have to shoot, you know, no, no time. And he said, well, but I didn't get time to, 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 to practice. And we said, well, that's, that's a pity. We have to shoot anyhow. It was so devastating. It was so frustrating, and we were so insensitive that we didn't understand that that could not be done. It was only later that I realized that we had done something completely inappropriate and that Peter Weller had, to, had, had, had all the right of the world to protest. And so ultimately Mike Medivoy said, okay, let's stop a couple of days and you work with Peter. So we started then to work with the system, with the costume and we had the video camera, we showed it to him and slowly he got, got the confidence and the ability to do it so that it looked good. Paul Verhoeven and Rob Bottin weren't even speaking to each other during the entire course of the film. In fact, Rob stopped even coming down there at all and turned the whole thing over to uh, what we call the robo team. Action will be everybody shooting, yes? Hey! And background! We took over 10, 12 empty buildings and dressed them and then had them rigged to explode. <laughs> We're all over the city blowing things up. We're on the news every night. Something was exploding or <laughs> there was something going on. Get it? Cut, cut. Now fill it up on number seven. Well, the explosion at the gas station was big enough that it did manage to set the building on fire. The fire department did threaten to shut us down. And our cameraman, the Ospicano, said, well, you know, that explosion, I don't think it's uh, registered on film, you know? It wasn't uh, really big enough, I think, for the camera to see. So we looked at the dailies, and what you see is what's in the film. <laughs> Robocop was a terrible experience in the production. I mean, everyone had a terrible time. It was hot, people were aggressively unpleasant, no one was getting along. The picture was over budget. It was over schedule. People from Orion would come down and say, stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding. And then they would fly off. And the next weekend, they'd fly down again. And it was six day weeks for uh, when we were in Pittsburgh. And people were just exhausted and ready to kill each other. Blow this cocksucker's head off. When I came back, People said I looked dead, and I really was white. I mean, it was really hard. Working on RoboCop was like being the victim of a violent crime. You just try to blank it out of your mind and memory. Well, I swore I'd never make another picture. Fellow executives, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the future of law enforcement. Ed 209. Ed 209 was supposed to look like these kind of weird Japanese toys that like were these big robots that had like gun arms. And I just said it looks something like that. And then I said it, it, I always had this idea that it was kind of like it had a shark mouth and it had these double machine guns and it looked like, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, what do you call the gun pods and the rocket pods you saw on the side of, of, of Huey attack copters. There's like a certain dumbness to it as well, so like a utilitarian stupidity to the thing. I felt that basically having this kind of feeling that there might be sensors here, but what does he see exactly? He's partially blind, blind for what's happening in the world, you know. The law enforcement has a side that's blind and that basically will just do like the Germans did in the Second World War when the commanding officers say, shoot these people, they would just do it. 
Now you've got something that looks really swell, and in, in an Ed 209's case, it does look ferocious and it does look intimidating, which was intentionally built into it, but it doesn't operate. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> It was supposed to be a big American product, you know? Again, it's a big thing, it's heavy. Who cares if it worked or not? Up until very recently, now what, uh, you, that's exactly what you could say about American cars. Because bigger is better. 6,000 SUX, an American tradition. Automobiles get styled, you know, to be emotionally, um, you know, appealing. And it's kind of uh, strange that, you know, military equipment gets a little bit of that same treatment. The front grill in Ed's face for the longest time was the opposite way it is, is now. It looked like he had a smile. We knew something was wrong with it. I wonder, oh yeah, well, if we turn the grill upside down, he has a menacing presence. What is that grill? You wouldn't put a big radiator on the face of a tank. You know, you might as well put, uh, you know, paint a bullseye around it and say, like, hit, hit me here. What we were shooting was just a prop, but it couldn't, it couldn't really act. People had to go up to it or stand next to it or touch it. That was the prop. 209 is currently programmed for urban pacification. Paul Verhoeven, he was screaming. He was like, every every time the robot was supposed to be moving, you know, he would act it out. And he would run through the movements and stuff. And if people didn't, weren't afraid of a giant prop, they were certainly afraid of him. At that time, there were no computer-generated images possible. This was just stop motion. I didn't know anything about stop motion. I had no idea. I forgot for a long time that I had to solve that too. There really wasn't a lot of money to work with, so we couldn't get into really any fancy um, uh, blue screen photography. And the only way at that time of, uh, of creating these artificial characters was either putting a guy in a suit or building a big prop or doing a stop motion animation puppet. The process or rear screen photography, which is what we used on RoboCop, you shoot a photographic background plate project it onto a translucent screen, build a stage, put your puppet in front of that, stop motion puppet in front of that, light that puppet so that it matches the background, and have any foreground objects that you need to and shoot that. Phil is, he's like another actor, and he delivers another performance, and Ed, Ed, Ed 209 was always to me the kind of the, the clown. <laughs> the whole gag of falling down the stairs, people find that so amusing that he can't go down the stairs. And I think it wouldn't have been as funny if Phil hadn't been there to do, I mean, there's a shot where the thing is reaching, it's going, and that's Phil. We actually built a uh, scale version of the stairs. So got all the dimensions and, uh, you know, whatnot from the staircase that they were using and matched the paint and stuff and built a miniature set, probably about four feet square. And we basically set the puppet up at the top of the stairs and flipped him down the stairs. There is, I believe, one, possibly two stop motion shots of RoboCop. When you have RoboCop right in front, he used a little miniature guy. He had to help push up the gun and blow his arm off. The final scene where Ed, Ed walks in from off camera, I got a call in the morning from Davison and John said, you know, can you do something funny? So, you know, I kind of backed some stuff off and found like this little fan and glued that onto Ed 209 and just kept the stupid little whirly gig, you know, spinning the whole time. And pretty much pantomime a drunk gag, you know, where he hiccups uh, and then he blah, 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 falls over and does this little uh. 10,000 acres of wooded residential land were scorched in an instant when a laser cannon aboard the Strategic Defense Peace Platform misfired today during routine startup tests. Robocop to me is, a, is essentially a satire. It's a satire of the 80s. Some people say it's a satire of Reaganomics. We've entered into a contract with the city to run local law enforcement. But it's just a satire of that kind of era when everybody was getting rich and everybody in business were being tough and stuff like that. There's a new guy in town. His name's Robocop. Bob Morton was a character that had been kicking around in my head for a while. He doesn't have a name. He's got a program. He's product. He's like the quintessential yuppie. He's only into consumption. He's only into excess. He's only into self-satisfaction. He's only into furthering himself. And he has no other agenda except himself, which was what many of the yuppies were criticized for back in the 1980s. Welcome to the club, Bob. Huh? Businessmen were reading Asian martial arts books to learn how to be better businessmen, and they were calling each other killers, and they were talking about hostile takeovers. Now that's how it's done in the big leagues, Johnson. You see an opening, you go for it. And so I was trying to raise it just to the thing where they really were killing each other. I'm cashing you 
Ow. Oh. It's a cliche now, but at the time it was kind of fun to watch the, you know, sort of the vicious yuppies. Fuck Jones. He fumbled the ball and I was there to pick it up. Robocop was really trying to write a, a funny movie that was masquerading as a genre sci-fi Terminator kind of movie. You probably don't think I'm a very nice guy, <laughs> do you? Buddy, I think you're slimy. Paul always said he wanted to make Murphy's death the most violent scene imaginable because you cannot have the resurrection until you have the crucifixion. Paul really immersed himself in that part of the film, killing the hero 25 minutes in. The figure of Jesus has always fascinated me and the mythological narrative in the Gospels fascinates me too. When I got the script, I started to realize that in some way, Robocop had something to do, for me at least, with Jesus. <laughs> These themes of, of crucifixion. Resurrection. Robocop. Even at the end, when Murphy is walking over the water, the line that Murphy says there... I'm not arresting you anymore. I thought that was an American Jesus saying, OK, when, when at a certain moment, we'll use the guns. At the end, he's an American Jesus, an American Jesus that uses his gun. That are alive, you are coming with me. We have to assume that Jesus himself was surrounded by people that used uh, swords. We killed you! Even if I say it's an American Jesus, we have to accept that Jesus, probably at the end of his life, perhaps the last couple of months, was not so different from a Che Guevara. Jesus says, in the past I told you you don't have to worry about anything. On the road you'll get from people what you need and whatever. But now I tell you, if you have a cloak, sell it and buy a sword. Even Jesus ultimately seemed to have promoted weapons. Come quietly or there will be trouble. It is more or less a machine, and later on it becomes more and more a human being. <laughs> You're a scum! It's the classic struggle for identity the classic struggle for people trying to assert their own individuality. Yes, I am a cop. And trying to retain that individuality in a world that insists on being bland and superficial and violent and knee-jerk. His soul is real, and that makes the film, I think, so, so interesting. That makes this, this, this character of Robocop so interesting. One of the elements that was extremely important was really the scenes where Murphy visits his house. Welcome, shopper. Let's take a stroll through your new home. And then you get these flashes of the past. This kind of in the brain going stuff that you would participate in the brains of a uh, half man half robot were extremely seductive to me because i felt there nearly a theological significance meaning the search for 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 the lost paradise Dad. did they blank his memory how much does he remember who owns his personality once the memory is blanked those are all existential questions that I thought were, uh, were really fun to explore in the script. Do you have a name? He's obviously in an existential dilemma. He's being driven by forces that he doesn't understand. And what it is, is it's just his own life. It's his own humanity. And eventually, of course, that breaks through. Robocop is remembering that he's not a robot, but remembering that somewhere in the part of that of the brain that's still alive, that he is um, he's Murphy. He can never go back. He's always going to be something different. He's not a man. He's not a machine. He's something different. He's his own creature, maybe. 
then in a wonderful revolutionary flourish, the created turns on the creator, just like the Frankenstein myth. You are under arrest. But in this case, on the side of law and order. Aiding and abetting a known felon. Which is kind of reactionary in a way. It became very clear that we had a, a character who was half machine and half human. Can you do that, Dad? It also became obvious that the machine elements would be represented very suitably by the synthesizer music and the electronic percussion. And the human part of, of the character would be represented by an orchestra to make him more human. I went through six or seven themes until we finally landed upon the RoboCop march. Paul Verhoeven he would walk around my studio like RoboCop, and he would move, you know, his arms and his head to just give me the, the idea of how he wanted it to be fluid. It's a pretty cool way to approach it. And making the violence over the top made it more palatable because it becomes humorous. I hate movies where violence is elliptic. I think to see people shooting and some, and then you see somebody on the street or he just like this without showing what damage a shot does, I think, I don't think that's a big advantage. <laughs> the original version of Robocop that ultimately was, uh, let's say, changed because of the MPA, the, the violence, of course, was much harsher in my cut. Okay, Fonzo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Then it, then it appeared in the theaters. Okay, Fonzo. <laughs> <laughs> by making the violence less, by making the violence more elliptic, you were taking away the, let's say, the nearly the burlesque or the grotesque of my staging. That was so much over the top that it was nearly kind of absurd. <laughs> oh. When the Atour 9 shoots the guy in the boardroom, it went on and on as the guy on the table is shot 60 times. And then the next line was... Somebody want to call a goddamn paramedic? And I thought that worked so well because it was completely absurd. The guy was gone, you know. There was nothing left nearly of him. It was completely exploded. All right, let's don't touch him. And then Mr. Jones the, comes to the old man. I'm sure it's only a glitch. A temporary setback. That worked all much funnier when it was over the top. You call this a glitch? RoboCop is really fascism for liberals. The picture has a very liberal viewpoint and does it in the most violent way imaginable. I don't make political statements. I think that I'm really reflecting what's happening in society. Nuke them. Get them before they get you. This is my perception of the United States. We practically are the military. This is what I feel that's happening in the United States. I don't condemn it, and I don't admire it. It's more that I, I see it, and I want to portray it. Whoa, a new side! America without guns, that's, 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 that's not America. And I don't want to hear any more talk about strike. We're not plumbers. We're police officers. There was a police screening, and I thought the police were going to be offended that we were making fun of you know, their life and death stuff. I really, you know, as we got closer, I got nervous. And what surprised me was they loved it. So to have a blue collar individual who has been stomped on by both the good guys and the bad guys, come up and be empowered to do something is a very fulfilling experience for an unempowered audience. And I remember a preview um, in New York in a very rough theater where a lot of uh, ethnic people and, and uh, pretty much blue collar. The summer's new superhero is America's new super hit movie, Robocop. It was so, well, let's say, fascinating to see people participate. And the American audience is always more participant in the movies than, for example, a Dutch um, audience. They are much more inclined to, ye to yell something to the screen or applaud or scream or whatever. At the end of the movie, when the man says to, to Robocop... Nice shooting, son. What's your name? The whole audience, before he could answer, yelled, Murphy! I believe the Boy Scouts of America had some sort of presentation 
with Robocop and Richard Nixon. And I was never really sure what the details were. But the meeting of the two just sort of boggles the mind. When people have faith that the streets are policed by incorruptible individuals, which in a way Robocop was, it renews a sense of community. And I think that's where the film also sort of touched people's unconscious, because they felt there was somebody out there who was not corruptible. Pakistan is threatening my border. That's it, Buster. No more military aid. It's more relevant now than it was, unfortunately. The entire outer skin will be like this. It's titanium, laminated with Kevlar. You can't be a Luddite. You have to just say it's here. I mean, look around you. They're all wearing the Kevlar stuff now. And we put that in, in Robocop because it was the new army stuff, and they're all going that way. The LAPD is becoming more like paramilitary forces, and they look just like peacekeeping troops. And I think it's because that's the, you know, the, the, what the cities are demanding now. We can expect 209 to become the hot military product for the next decade. Now we have more Dick Jones' vision of law enforcement, a militarism in which no secrets get out, which is really troubling when you think about it. But, you know, that's, America deserves that. It's a land of private property where everything has to be owned, serial numbered, protected, and controlled. We're addicted to a pretty bad drug called capitalism, and until we get over that, we're gonna need police in the way that they are. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.